Just to say welcome to you all. It's fantastic um, to be able to host you here at RCSI and, and share our research with you. And we're really looking forward to your feedback on our work. Um, so m my main take home message tonight is that research is important. All the developments that you heard from Peter and how things are changing in the clinic, that all comes from research. And the reason I'm saying that is sometimes people, whether it's politicians or others, have this view that research is a luxury. But I think everyone in this room appreciates that research is what makes a difference in the clinic, in our lives, and helps us live with epilepsy and hopefully cure it one day. So <clears throat> I was gonna start by just introducing the Future Neuro Center. Um, so Future Neuro is a research center um, a lot of whose work, not all of their work, but a lot of our work is on the condition of epilepsy. It is funded by, amongst other agencies, including Epilepsy Ireland, it is funded by Science Foundation Ireland. And Science Foundation Ireland are one of the main research funders here in Ireland. Research centres are a little bit different from normal research activities. So normally, we as scientists apply as individuals to our funders to do work. This center is a little bit different. What Science Foundation Ireland did is they asked the community of scientists in Ireland to make proposals around areas that they think, as a community, that they're strong and good at, right? So scientists who are researching epilepsy and other neurological conditions came together when this call came out and said, we feel we are good at learning about epilepsy and ALS and other neurological conditions. And we, led by David Henschel here, put in a bid for epilepsy and ALS, et cetera, and that bid was successful. So launched in 2017 and led also by Bridget, who's here with us today, uh, we've been active now for nearly five years and we've received in total about 10 million euro in funding from Science Foundation Ireland. So there's multiple different scientists involved and they're also across different universities in Ireland. So this isn't just RCSI trying to learn about epilepsy, it's different scientists across RCSI, across Trinity, UCD, DCU, working together to try and learn about these conditions. The other thing about Science Foundation centers is we try and engage a lot with industry Right, so industry need to work with academia, with people impacted by conditions to try and develop new technology for, for treating those conditions. So as a center, we also work quite a lot with industry. We have three broad themes to our work. Diagnostics, so that's the area I'm involved in a lot. So I'm passionate about how we can use genetics to learn more about epilepsy, so that would be under diagnostics. Therapeutics, so Peter mentioned a lot of these new treatments that are coming through, um, and David, who's gonna speak after me, will, will speak to our work on that. And then also e-health and digital health. So you might be familiar with the electronic patient record in epilepsy at, at Beaumont Hospital in St. James's. So how can we improve that type of a system? Maybe connect you know, seizure watches, that um, remote monitoring EEG that, that Peter mentioned. Are there ways to connect those types of devices to your electronic health record and learn from that data. So those are the three broad themes within uh, Future Neuro. Uh, we were awarded 10 million from Science Foundation Ireland. What the Irish fund, uh, what Science Foundation as a state funder likes you to do is go out and use that money to try and attract other money from say the European Commission, right? Can we show our expertise to the European Commission who also fund research so that we can bring more money into Ireland to study neurological conditions, including epilepsy? And same thing with industry. Can we show our expertise to industry so that they want to invest in learning more about epilepsy and other neurological conditions? So for every euro the government gave us, we managed to bring in another euro from the European Commission and a euro from industry. So there's a bigger, kind of resource for us to learn about epilepsy and other conditions. Okay, so that, that's what Future Neuro is about as a center. Now I'm gonna speak a little bit about genetics, what we've learned about genetics through Future Neuro, but also the, the wider research community. And I suppose the starting point is to think, 
if we go back to the year 2000, which for me seems like just yesterday, it is obviously 20 years ago, but if you think about what Peter and his colleagues had as neurologists in the epilepsy clinic or how much they, they use genomics, as diagnostic tools, they had EEG, which, which Peter mentioned, they had MRI, which you're probably all familiar with, brain, brain imaging, uh, but genetics was basically absent from the clinic in the year 2000. Um, if we zoom forward to today, you're going to be familiar that there are lots of different types of epilepsy. And Peter mentioned, you know, rare forms of epilepsy like Dravet syndrome. Some of those rare conditions have a very high genetic cause, or a way we put it is the diagnostic yield from a genetic test is very, very high. So say if you have a Dravet syndrome, the yield, you know, the chance of you finding a genetic cause is very, very high uh, for that type of a condition. Why is that? because the research community have found genes that we've been able to translate, as Adele said, how do you make this stuff get into the clinic? Scientists found genes that we could then push towards the clinic so Peter and his colleagues could help make diagnosis, perhaps in members of the community here, in their children, in their loved ones who are impacted by epilepsy. And this diagram is showing you different genes that were discovered since the first one, which I think was in 1997, to today. So you can see there's an explosion in these genetic findings that then translate into the clinic. So one of the breakthroughs that we made in Future Neuro was understanding, well, what's the yield in adults impacted by some of these rare epilepsies? So it was well understood that children, say, with the Dravet syndrome had a high diagnostic yield, but what does it look like in, in adults? And we were able to show it's actually a, a high proportion of such cases also have an identifiable genetic cause. And that work helped us try and build capacity within clinics at Beaumont and St. James's and other hospitals to bring genomics more into the adult services. So we helped develop what we call multidisciplinary team meetings. So if you're trying to study genetics in the context of a patient to see if they have a genetic cause, you need a multidisciplinary team. You need the doctor, the likes of Peter, you need a, a genetic scientist who can read the sequence data. You need a clinical geneticist who can help interpret those data and, and uh, explain the, the results to the, to the, to the uh, individual. So this multidisciplinary team meeting, a Future Neuro helped establish it. We hold one or two of these meetings per month at Beaumont now. It has many different clinicians, geneticists, et cetera, involved. And we also, in terms of our digital health work, built a section of the electronic patient record to hold genomic data, right? So we further enhanced the EPR at Beaumont and St. James's so it could hold these genetic results and also facilitate these meetings. Just to give you an impact of what a genetic diagnosis can mean. So Peter kind of hinted at this. Unfortunately for most people today, even getting a genetic diagnosis for their epilepsy does not necessarily mean a, a change in treatment or prognosis. But here's a, what I think is a quite a stunning example of where it has made a big difference. So this was a 50-year-old man who was diagnosed with non-lesional extra temporal lobe epilepsy. Uh, he's had seizures since he was a teenager, continues to have two to three seizures every night, um, taken multiple different anti-seizure anti medications, um, but his condition is largely refractory. Um, he has a mutation in the gene DEPDEC5, which I think you mentioned, was it three of your kids? Have, have this, um, a, a mutation in this gene, not necessarily the same one, a genetic variant. The other thing to say here, without using up too much time, is all of our DNA, all of our genomes are full of genetic changes, right? So when I talk about a genetic cause to your epilepsy, people shouldn't think, oh, I'm so, somehow very different to everyone else. All of our genomes are full of these genetic changes. It's just that some can cause epilepsies and others not. So this individual, a genetic change in this gene, DEPDEC5, um, this gene is involved in the mTOR pathway that Peter mentioned. Uh, it's also the genes in this pathway can cause tuberous sclerosis. And Peter mentioned this drug, Everlimus, that's been licensed for use in tuberous sclerosis. So the clinical team tried this treatment also for this individual with DEPDEC5 associated epilepsy because the gene is in the same kind of molecular pathway. And the results were quite stunning. You can see the drop in seizure frequency 
uh, quite dramatically from 86 seizures, I think this was per month, um, down to after six months, eight seizures per month. Now, just to stress, this is in one individual. I am absolutely not saying that for every person with this type of epilepsy, you're gonna get this type of response. But we tried it in, in, I think it was four individuals, and the overall, it was quite a positive picture. So the hope is this could be a, a treatment going forward for this type of epilepsy. There are other, what we call precision approaches for rare genetic epilepsies. So it looks like a lot on this slide, but unfortunately, these kind of potentially positive outcomes are still only for a small proportion of epilepsies overall. How much time do I have left, Ido? Um, 10, minutes. 10 minutes. I was going to try and do this in 10 minutes. Yeah, okay. So, if you... Two minutes? minutes yeah, yeah, 10 minutes. I, how much do I have left? Okay, right. So very, very quickly, the other thing we've been trying to do is influence national strategy around genomics. Um, there's been a vacuum in Ireland over the last couple of years in terms of leadership and strategy for genomics. That's now changed, so the HSE has published a national strategy. Future Neuro helped in a small way to influence and inform that strategy, but we're also doing work on implementation. So we held a deliberative dialogue, and the outcome of that is in your packs. So I encourage you to take a look at it to figure out how do we implement this strategy that's you know, informed from the perspective of neurological conditions and people who work with, research on, and are impacted by neurological conditions. And that's all in, in your booklet. I encourage you to, to take a look. And some people in this audience, including uh, Maria, uh, helped um, uh, with this dialogue. So look, I'm, I'm not gonna go through the details of it. I had some slides, but I'm out of time. But I would encourage you to just read the uh, read the report or even glance through it. So just to summarize, if I can get to the end. Duh, 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 duh. Um, Future Neuro is helping integrate genomics into the Irish Neurology Clinic. It's helping make diagnosis for people impacted by epilepsy and other conditions. Um, when we can make such a diagnosis, it can potentially inform on different ways to treat that individual. And it doesn't necessarily need to be with a, with a drug. Sometimes a change in diet, like for GLUT1 deficiency syndrome, can be the appropriate treatment. We're also helping inform and implement national policy on genetics uh, in, in our healthcare system. And there's a lot more we're doing that unfortunately um, we didn't have time to discuss today. But thanks again for coming and hopefully you find tonight informative. So I'm now gonna pass over to David who's gonna speak on therapeutics. Thank you, uh, JP. So um, from, from Peter and, and Giampiero, you've heard a little bit about the sort of current um, treatments that we've got for epilepsy. My job and the, the job of the sort of therapeutics team in Future Neuro is to try and go 10 years or, or more maybe into the future to try and uh, develop the, the, the next generation of epilepsy uh, drugs. So um, <clears throat> many of you who have or have children or family members with epilepsy will be familiar with the picture on the left. This is what some of you will be taking, or your children, or your, your loved ones, many times a day. Um, these are anti-seizure medicines. They're usually taken as a pill. Um, we've heard about some of the other ways that we can treat epilepsy as well through, through surgery. Uh, diet is also an, uh, a way, particularly in children, something called the ketogenic diet. And there's these amazing devices now where we may be able to actually stimulate parts of the brain and stop them from, from giving us uh, seizures. The way that a lot of these medicines work is by sort of interfering with the signals between different brain cells. And by, um, by doing that, it, it, it can have effects on, on epilepsy. So what, what's the problem? Why, why do we need any more medicines? We've heard that there are about 40 anti-seizure medicines now, so maybe we have enough. So there's three problems. First is that most of these medicines all work in a similar way. They basically dampen down your, your brain's excitability. Now, that can be enough to, to stop seizures happening, but it also dampens down the excitability of every other part of the brain. And this is why uh, side effects such as sedation, brain fog, uh, make, make life very uncomfortable, particularly if you continue to have to go to higher and higher doses of these medicines. Here's the next problem. You have to keep taking them. You have to keep taking them 
all the time. You, you really need to have a steady level of these medicines in your brain to, to ensure that seizures don't break through. So uh, depending on the medicine, you may be taking them in the morning, at lunchtime, in the evening, and it's very important you take them at the right time every single day. Okay, so that is changing your life. Your life <laughs> is now being dictated by these medicines. And then this is the last problem. So um, we, we've talked about how many new medicines have, have been developed in the last few years. But th this is a, a sort of a graph which tells a, an uncomfortable story, and that is that if you have a diagnosis of epilepsy today, you have the same chance of becoming seizure-free as you did in 1980. So we have, we have dozens more medicines, but they are no better at stopping you having uh, seizures. They're better tolerated, for sure. Side effects are getting better, um, but the proportion of people that become drug-resistant is just the same now as it used to be. So we have to think differently uh, into the future. So how can we do that? Well, we need to know a lot about the brain. If we're going to develop new types of medicine, we need to understand what is going on inside the brain. And because of colleagues uh, such as Peter and those at, at the hospital, we can do this. Okay, so we can do brain scans, all right? But that's not really going to tell us what's happening in brain cells. But because of the small numbers of patients that go on and have surgery for treatment-resistant epilepsy, those, some of those patients will offer to have the piece of brain tissue that's been taken out um, provided for research. And again, this is echoing what Giampiero said. It's so critical to, to have the, the, the involvement of, of patients. And so a piece of brain tissue, this is an actual piece of brain tissue, um, is, is removed, the part of the brain that's been triggering the seizures. And then that piece of brain tissue could now get shipped to a laboratory such as ours here at RCSI, and we can do research on it. So what you're looking at here is a, a very, very thin slice of the brain. The little brown spots are individual brain cells. So what we can do is, is take technology which measures all the little things going on inside these brain cells. So we can measure the activity of every single gene in the human genome inside every single cell in the brain. So we can now spot things that are not normal. And what we find is that there are many different things inside a piece of brain that's triggering epilepsy. So these are some examples. So we have sometimes we have extra cells that shouldn't be there. Sometimes we have missing cells that should be there. We have inflammation. Um, we have changes in the energy state of these cells. And we have changes in the uh, delivery of the energy source. So things like sugar, oxygen, all of this. Lots and lots of things are changing. So we now have some really exciting new targets to go after in the future, okay? So we can start to design drugs against these very different targets and see if they can, can work on epilepsy. And ultimately, perhaps we can find something that can cure the epilepsy rather than just dampening down the excitability uh, of the brain. So I'm going to very briefly touch on three of the things that Future Neuro has been working on. So the first of these is around the... the the blood vessels within the brain. We've known for the last few years that when you have a seizure, the, the blood vessels in the brain open a little bit, more than they should. So normally the blood vessels in the brain are very, very tightly packed together because there's things circulating in the blood you don't want to get into your brain. But these blood, cell, uh, blood vessels get a bit leaky. Things start leaking out and getting into the brain that shouldn't. Researchers at Trinity that are part of the Future Neuro Center discovered that one of the genes that holds these blood vessels together in the brain is, is sort of missing. At least it's a, it, it, there's a sort of reduction in the amount of this protein that acts a little bit like glue between brain cells. And they created a model of this. They sort of reduced the level of this brain glue, and they found that it could cause a seizure-like condition. So they've now been searching for molecules that can maybe boost the level of this brain glue in cells, and they've actually found one. There's actually a little molecule that selectively boosts the amount of this brain glue. So we're now testing this with them, and the early studies are exciting. They seem to suggest that it can reduce seizures in some models. So that's, that's very exciting. Okay, next thing that we've been working on is around inflammation. So you may have, may have seen that on one of the slides. This little guy, this is a, a, a very basic high school model of a molecule called ATP. 
ATP is your body's energy currency. So every cell in the body is packed full of this stuff. But it turns out that this is actually released from brain cells. And it's a sort of a warning system. If too much of this gets released, it triggers inflammation. It shows that some damage has occurred uh, within the brain. And over the years, people have, have basically kind of figured out the pathway by which this little extra signal for damage uh, works. And one of the things it does is act on uh, a little channel in the brain. And it turns out that there's a drug you can use to block that channel. So what we've been doing is studying what happens when you use this blocker. And what it does is it really dramatically reduces inflammation in the brain. And through work with our clinical colleagues, we can now test this in human brain tissue. So over the last few years, we've figured out a way to, after the brain tissue is removed from a patient, rather than sort of freezing it and, and sending it to us in a freezer, you can bubble it with a solution, keep it alive. So you can keep it alive for a few hours, add your test drug, and then find out if it reduces excitability within the brain. This is work by Tobias Engel's group. So here's a little piece of brain tissue that otherwise would have gone in a bin. And it's been bubbled with brain tissue. It doesn't have any feelings. It can't feel pain. And then you can record these epileptic-like activities. So these little blue lines here, these are very high-frequency firing of brain cells. So they shouldn't be firing at this rate normally. And when you add this drug for a short period of time, it reduces the firing rate. And then if you wash the drug off, then it goes back up again. So this is a really unique thing that you can do in epilepsy that's actually impossible in most other brain diseases. You can take a piece of living brain tissue and, and study drug effects on it. So it's very, very um, uh, exciting. So the last thing I'm going to mention before I get off the stage, um, we've been thinking kind of even bigger and more ambitiously. If we can sort of look at all of the gene changes that occur at once, you know, can we find one way to change everything uh, all at once? So we've got all of these things going wrong on the left. We can figure out all of the genes which do that. Can we now block or activate uh, those genes. And there's a molecule we've been working on for the last 10 years called a microRNA. So this is related, you may have heard of mRNA, part of the COVID vaccine. This is related to that sort of a chemical cousin of that. And one of the things this does is sticks onto lots and lots of genes within, within cells and within the brain. So if we can find the right pattern of genes for this RNA, we can then have effects on the RNA. And one of the ones that we discovered was increased deep within the brain of somebody with epilepsy. Well, there are several people with epilepsy. And we can now design a little drug to this. So we can actually design a sort of a DNA-like artificial drug that will stick on, a little bit like Velcro, gluing onto uh, another piece of Velcro. We can stick onto this and block it from, from working. And we have some models of epilepsy. We can do this. We've introduced this. And over a couple of days, it reduces seizure activity, and it doesn't come back. So, so far, we've been following this for weeks and weeks and weeks, and the seizures do seem to, to go away. So, so we're really optimistic that this is an exciting new treatment. Now, this isn't yet ready for people, but we're working with a group of veterinarians to test this in dogs with naturally occurring epilepsy. So some of you who have pet dogs may know that epilepsy is quite frequent and common in dogs. It's, it's as common in dogs as in humans. And some breeds, it's even more common than that. So it can be as high as one in five dogs of certain breeds have naturally occurring epilepsy. So here you have a, a model that you could test a drug in before going into to humans, because some of the things that we're working on are very different drugs to what we're used to. So um, we've been working with a group of veterinarians. We've actually measured levels of this molecule, which also seem to be increased in dogs with drug-resistant epilepsy. And we've, been, uh, we've just begun the clinical trial a couple of months ago. Two dogs have been tested. Uh, both are doing well so far, no, no bad side effects. In fact, seizures seem to be down. And I'm going to finish with this guy, <laughs> the world's first dog to be treated with this new type of gene therapy. So, thank you.